Unspoiled Network Podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Heartstopper, Season 1, Episode 8, the final episode of Season 1, Boyfriend. In this episode, well, we finally have a coming out and this was just a heartwarming time, although things are not totally settled because now we have to get Tao and Elle together. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Cindy for commissioning this episode. Um, I just want to mention to off, off the top, I've had some people inquire whether season two has been commissioned and it hasn't yet. So if anybody is wanting to pitch in on that, um, you can either go to my booking site, which I'll look up the exact address for you right now, because that can be sort of a confusing thing. Or you can email me if you want to book the season ahead um, at unspoiledpodcast at gmail.com. But uh, there's also a Discord group for Spoil Me Planning. So if you want to throw in with somebody, that is also an option. Um, but yeah, this, uh, I'm, I'm really wanting to get into the next season, but I don't want to start watching and then be like, having to wait months to talk about it. So I'm not going to do it. Uh, let's see. It's spoilme.simplybook.me is the site. Um, so, all right, let's start this one off, you guys, because this is, this was such a rough episode at first. Like, we're coming off of the fight between Tao and uh, Harry. And I should mention, Harry does not show up in the finale at all he has been suspended for fighting apparently Tao was not suspended which i am more than fine with because harry always started everything and i kind of enjoy the fact that Tao wasn't because i i think that in a lot of cases people would have suspended both of them and to me the fact that Tao wasn't suspended indicates that the teachers are paying attention and that they noticed that this kid is the one that's always like starting shit. And maybe they talk to witnesses and, you know, whatever, because, you know, one could say with that fight that Tao actually started the fight, like in some ways, but it's so unfair to say that. And I think that a lot of people know what I'm talking about in terms of like that bullshit justice that happens in high school where teachers will feel like they need to teach a lesson to both sides of something just because somebody like lost their temper finally after being tormented for months, they wind up in the same place as their tormentor, which makes no sense. It just like you see this all the time or even worse the person who finally stood up for themselves gets punished while the person who was tormenting them gets no punishment at all, which I've also seen. Um, so this, like, I was really, really, really glad at least that we don't have to deal with Harry at all this episode. I am a little bit nervous about it though. I will say like, you know, if I do get to cover season two, my concern is Harry comes back eventually. And then what? You know, I feel like I want him to be in such disgrace that he just cools his jets, but he doesn't seem like the type that does that. So I don't know how much to expect. Um, but anyway, okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So we start things off with Charlie texting Tao and, you know, we see at the top of the screen the like last time Tao said, I love you. And then at the bottom Tao saying, don't bother. We're barely even friends anymore. 
And Charlie has written to him, Tao, are you okay? I'm so sorry. And it made me so angry to see Charlie apologizing to Tao. It made me so angry, you guys. And like, look, I want to let go of this. I do. I understand in some ways how Tao is feeling. And I even said when Tao was freaking out after having seen that Nick agreed to go on a date, I understood his feelings of protectiveness for his friend. But the fact that he like yelled, this is all your fault at Charlie when later on He's talking to Nick about how, like, Charlie is the type of person who thinks that just existing is annoying people. I wanted to shake him. I'm like, you know this about your friend. And you yelled at him that it's all his fault that you and Harry got into a fight. It had nothing to do with him. What do you even mean? And... Granted, he apologizes later. I know, like, he says, like, I, I shouldn't have said that, but it's like, I don't know, guys. I don't know. I, I sometimes have to stop and be like, am I just not a forgiving person? And I actually don't think that's really true, but I think that I have a really specific requirement for forgiveness that isn't met most of the time because frankly, a lot of the time, what is meant by forgiveness is like, can't you just pretend this never happened? And I say that fully admitting that's not what's happening here. You know, like later on the, there's an actual conversation, but I was so bothered by the fact that Tao is able to like, talk to Nick, frankly, about Charlie's personality and what he struggles with, with no awareness of what he himself seems to be doing to his friend. And especially the like, don't bother, we're barely friends anymore. It's weird because like, you know, that's the last message that was sent by him before Charlie, uh, like tells him, Hey, I'm sorry. And Part of me wants to be like, well, Charlie could have reached out to Tao when Tao said this, but I felt like Tao's anger was so unjustified that I don't want Charlie to reach out to Tao. It just felt like he was being put in this position where he has to like constantly be scraping for approval. And I don't disagree that like you've got to put work into your friendships and you you can't just like ditch friends in favor of a boyfriend because this is a thing that like especially in high school you can really stumble into although it can become a thing much later in life too and I definitely struggled with this for a while in my 20s of just like kind of letting actual friendships lag or disappear because I would throw my entire self into my romantic relationship at the expense of everything else. But it, it was just so like it, it, that is not exactly what was happening with Charlie in so much as it being like, Oh, I just need all of my validation coming from my romantic partner. It was a really fraught situation because of what was going on with Charlie and Nick. And the fact that Charlie is gay is just adds like a, a different element to things that makes everything a little bit more complicated for him. So even if it were that Nick were straight, like, him crushing as hard as he was on Nick and all of that. I just like wanted some more grace for him. So when this like starts off with him apologizing and Tao not responding, I just got so angry and there's, he starts like playing the drums and his sister comes in and it's just like, they're very, very loud. And finally she's like, what is going on? What are you upset about? 
and he s- tells her about Ben and he's like I used I was dating this guy and I really liked him but he made me feel like I was ruining his life and like he wished I didn't exist and then everything with Nick and him fighting with his friends I am ruining his life and it makes me think that maybe it would be better if I didn't exist. And this broke my heart, y'all. This killed me. Like, it was the, the delivery of that line and the way he just dissolves is so brutal. And it feels so real. And I think that I know a lot of people like this. I thankfully don't struggle with this particular kind of like self-esteem thing with like genuinely believing that I am a burden on everyone around me in this way. But I believe that most of like most of the time when I need support, I don't like to reach out because I don't want to become one. And I tend to just really kind of keep it to a couple of really specific, extremely close people. And uh, this, like, the just him saying this and how it looks from his perspective. I hadn't really been completely comprehending exactly what direction his thoughts were going in until he said it like this. And then I was like, oh no, because, you know, this is the, the kind of thought that if followed to its end can lead into a suicide attempt. And just, you know, queer kids have a higher rate because of feelings like this. And I got really, really concerned. I was starting to be like, are we, are we doing that? Because like, on the one hand, I don't want to see that. I don't want that kind of like trauma in this show. But it wouldn't be an unreasonable thing to include because that is reality. So I was really like, you know, struggling with what I felt about this. Um, I'm sorry, there's a bunch of chat here. Uh, Stacy, I spent so much of this episode literally wringing my hands. That's book Dion says... So the way that I think Tao blurts out this is all your fault comes from Tao having drawn Harry's fire all this time by standing up to him when Charlie was getting bullied, resulting in Tao getting bullied and no one else standing by him while Charlie was only concerned about how Nick was being affected. It's definitely wrong that he shouted at Charlie with the knowledge he had about Charlie. It was an upset response. Him holding a grudge about it was spiteful as well. Cindy says, I love Tori's response here. She doesn't tell him he's wrong or that he's imagining it. She just tells him that he's not ruining her life. Yeah, she she's such a good sister. Agreed. Uh, that's my book says, yeah, Charlie keeps his thoughts really close to his chest. Yeah. And I think, you know, Charlie has that thing <laughs> that you keep it close to your chest because you know that if you say any of this, everybody's going to insist they love you and you don't believe them. You just think they're saying that because they have to, because they want to be nice, but that at the bottom of their heart, the truth is what you think it is or that you've like, you're not going to get the real answer out of them because you've tricked them. That's another fun one is thinking, Oh, I've tricked you into thinking that I'm cool and great. And that's what a bad person I am is that I have like somehow bamboozled you, which if you stop and think about that, is so disrespectful to your friend to believe that they are are so easily bamboozled to think that they after everything you've been through with your friends don't know you well enough now to be able to tell that like who you really are but we don't think of things that way what it comes down to when you have this kind of mindset is simply I am a burden and no matter what anybody says, that is true. So anything that they say, there has to be some way to explain how 
they can still say that and yet I'm still a burden. And you can just figure out any number of explanations, you know? So yeah, this scene was really, really sweet. And I loved her acting in this as well, because she's clearly like just as worried about him in the moment as I was at the time, you know, I just felt her being like, Oh God, what do I do? Um, so then we go to the next morning and him coming into school and Tao is straight up ignoring him. He sits between Tao and Isaac. Isaac's reading a book, by the way, called Gender Explorers. And it's so funny. They do a similar sort of thing in some ways in the show as they do on sex education, where there's a sense of timelessness about the, like, look of everything. And it's not exactly like, you know, everybody has cell phones and stuff. So it's not like we're really attempting that. But like the cover of this book, it looks like something out of 1980. Um, but anyway, so I just was really bothered by the fact that he sits down and Isaac, like, first of all, the fact that there's a chair only between Isaac and Tao so that he's forced to sit next to Tao, but then Isaac tells him, he says he doesn't want to talk to you. And I was just kind of like, then fucking move over, Isaac, and make it so that he doesn't have to sit next to the dude who doesn't want to talk to him. Like, you know, and then he, there's a mention of sports day, which is coming up. And I don't know what, like sports day, everybody's talking about how excited they are for it and cheering this is a nightmare, like the worst. I would have been, I would have hated this so much, you guys. Oh my God. This is something that I am really like, I understand the emphasis on it, especially like in the last couple of decades when so much of our downtime is spent sitting that putting an emphasis on sports feels like it's, it's meant to be a healthful pursuit, but there are so many other ways to be active and healthy and schools have no imagination when it comes to that. And it always ends up in sports teams and it's like such a narrow, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like you could do dance classes and that would be something that I would have fucking loved. We had a small sequence during our school year where we would do country line dancing and I dreaded gym class all year, except for when we had the country line dancing segment, which I fucking loved. And I think about this so much that like how different it could have been if we had just made that a curriculum that you could do instead of learning to play volleyball for no fucking reason. It's just ugh. sports at school is, is to me like one of the circles of hell. I can't, I was a part of teams right up until like my sophomore year in high school where I was like, I can't do this anymore and ditched. But I have never been that specific kind of unhappy since doing that. The, the closest thing I can come up with is when I've had some really bad dead end jobs with people that I didn't like. And that's as close as I can say, because it's similar in that you are stuck having to work with and around people that you don't like doing something you don't care about. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, Cindy says 100% agree sports day slash field day was everyone's favorite and I hated it. And like when I, ha we had a field day in, I think like middle school, it might've been elementary school, but that was like, oh, you know, you do like sack races or three legged races or whatever, things like that, which that is more fun because it's a game in a way that's very like individual like you know you just got a team of two people I can cope with that but the high jump and everybody's watching you do a jump like for what reason who enjoys this let me just fucking like utterly humiliate myself as I attempt to to cross a bar like oh fucking kill me 
Um, Stacy says field day sucked and line dancing would have been so much better. We did square dancing and no one ever wanted to partner with me. Oh, I'm sorry, Stacy. Yeah. Line dancing is way better because you don't want to do partners at all. Like I, that's wild that they would even bother with a dance class where you need a partner. What a bad move. Um, sorry. Cindy says Dion, even if they're just at different places at the same table, I missed what Dion said up here. Uh, seating places are compulsory in secondary school classrooms in the UK. Usually kids aren't allowed to change where they sit in class. Oh, okay. Um, it's ridiculous. My daughter had a falling out with a friend, but still had to sit next to her the rest of the term. <sighs> that sucks. That's the kind of thing that'll give you a stomach ache over the anxiety of having to like, you know, interact with this person that blows. So anyway, this uh, culminates in him trying to say, oh, we could do like a, a sports day with like all of us doing the same event. And Tao is like, well, you're on the rugby team. And he says, why does that matter? And Isaac says, well, the rugby team has a rugby game that they all play. So, yeah, you aren't going to be able to do anything with us. And... um it's just another like, you know, moment of underlining the fact that they are not living the same life that they used to. So then we get the most awful moment. I hated this, you guys. Nick and Charlie run into each other in the hall. Nick says, do you want to get lunch together? He's so casual because he doesn't see that there's anything wrong yet. He's not getting it and is very friendly. And he steps toward Charlie, who doesn't even want to make eye contact. He does, but it's like unwilling. And then he just says, I can't. Sorry. And takes off. And Nick looks after him like, what the fuck? And we get Charlie then going over to the team leader, the captain is it called captain? Well, she's a coach. The captain's a player. She's a coach. And he quits the rugby team. And she asks, "Has have the boys been giving you a hard time? Is there anyone that I need to talk to? And he says, no, it's just me. Is Harry on the rugby team, you guys? I'm, I actually don't remember. He is, right? Because he was in the locker room talking about you know, Nick hooking up with uh, Tara or what's the other girl's name? Imogen. So he is. I wonder, like, you know, if she is aware of what all went down with him and knows that there's some friction there. But um, this whole thing, like, I really hated this scene because it feels like he's giving up on something that he shouldn't because he like wants to be part of his friend group again, the way that he used to be. But at the same time, I did not get the impression that he really liked rugby. He was just doing the rugby to be near Nick. So it was a fraught thing where part of me wanted him to like not quit just to make Tao happy. But I felt like he was only on the team to make Nick happy. So I wasn't actually sure which way, like what, I don't know what Charlie wants. I genuinely don't. I am not sure if Charlie wants to play. I don't know if he likes the game. I don't know. Um, so Let's see. Oh, sorry. Cindy says, I think Nick was very conscious that if they ha hadn't been interrupted by Harry slash Tao's fight, Charlie was going to break up with him. Oh, I didn't think about that. Maybe. Uh, Dion says, so annoying that Charlie could have gone to coach Singh about Harry and his guffawing teammates all the time, but didn't go to her. I mean, he could, but like, he had that talk with her briefly 
about how they all seem to think that like gay boys can't do sports. And here I am a gay boy who can't do sports. I think she was aware, but there just comes a point where like how, what is, what more is she supposed to do? I guess. Like, I don't know. She, cause all she says to him is like, I know a lot of gay people who play sports and she doesn't really like get anybody else gathered together, which she could have done. I don't know. Um, Cindy says he joined for Nick, but Charlie really does seem to enjoy the game. Fun fact, Joe Locke, Charlie's actor, really didn't like filming those scenes. Filming the rugby scenes? scenes? Stacy says, I thought Charlie only joined because Nick asked him to. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think he only joined because Nick asked him. I just couldn't tell if he grew to like the game or if he was just like making himself do it, even though he would have definitely quit if it weren't for Nick. So anyway, this is when we get the scene where Nick and Tao talk and they each are looking for Charlie and think that Charlie is eating with each of them. Nick says, is Charlie avoiding you too? And Tao says, I'm avoiding him because I'm pissed off at him. I was worried about him joining the team become and becoming friends with you because I knew he'd get picked on by some of the idiots in your year. And guess what? He did. I'm done trying to protect him when he's forgotten I exist. Like I deserve to be appreciated. And if he just told me that you two were going out and Nick says, I think he didn't tell you because he really cares about your opinion. And yeah, like, you know, Tao just made it really clear. He was not going to approve of Nick, you know, and he says, and he loves you. And Tao says, I'll believe it when I see it. I just, I, I, I just like, okay so here's the thing Tao's behavior when he had found out when he saw that Nick agreed to go out with Imogen I understood and defended because it was a fucked up thing and I would have been very worried about my friend also that said it's really clear that Tao just thinks the worst of Nick to begin with due to who his friends are, which isn't unreasonable because usually who you decide to hang out with is a reflection of either who you also are or at least what you'll tolerate, which is sometimes just as revealing. But there is a way to look out for your friend without constantly insinuating that they don't know how to look after themselves or that they're burying their head in the sand and a way to look out for them that isn't pushing them away. And what Tao really wants, he, I like what he wanted, if we're being totally honest, was for him to tell Charlie that Nick isn't into you. He's not gay and he said that he's going out with Imogen and for Charlie to completely drop everything and decide, okay, Tao's right. He knows I'm just going to follow his advice and totally ignore Nick. That's what Tao wanted because he really thought he understood what was going on and he didn't see what was happening behind the scenes. So what you have to balance there is looking out for your friend, but also trusting them that they're reading certain signs. And if they are wrong, letting them fuck up. And Tao is trying to be way too controlling and his like, I'm not being appreciated. It's really like, I'm going to move my screen down a little bit here because this is tilted so far up. It's really him just being like, I should be listened to. You should do what I am saying because I know more than you. 
and you should just obey. That's really what it is that he is is after here. Like he's talking about I you know, we're barely friends anymore anyway. He couldn't go to that one weekend of movie night and you threw a fit. Did you try to reschedule that? Did you try to set up another thing where you all hung out again? No, you didn't get what you wanted that one time and then you just gave it up and didn't attempt to invite him to anything again. If anything, the one giving up on this friendship is Tao. He's the one that's closing the door repeatedly when he just doesn't get exactly his way the first try. He decides, well, then fuck you then. And ices Charlie out knowing that Charlie considers himself a nuisance. So Charlie is not going to reach out to Tao to hang out because he is going to expect that Tao does not want to see him. So the thing to do if you're trying to be an actual supportive friend is you can be upset that he wants to hang out with somebody else instead of do the movie night together. Completely valid to just be like, I wanted to do this thing and you clearly just forgot and you aren't coming and that sucks. Sure. But then it's time to adapt and and set up another thing and try again. And he is just the instant that Charlie isn't behaving the way he wants Charlie to behave, just turning his back and being like, wow, that's so selfish. And people have their own lives, dude. You know, it's just really frustrating. Um, Cindy says, well, after the failed movie night, they did have that sleepover at Charlie's house, which I always took as Charlie's attempt to make up for the lost movie night. Okay. Was remind me i remember the movie night at or the sleepover at charlie's nick wasn't at that was he right he wasn't was it was l at that i can't remember if it was all of them or not um cindy says and tau still acts like that he's a lot i love him but he's a mess nick was not l was okay Okay, so then even worse, like Charlie attempted to make it up to you and you're acting like that doesn't matter. Ew, that's so much worse. Ugh, I'm sorry. I, I know that I go on a lot about how mad I am at Tao in a lot of these episodes. But, you know, frankly, he's kind of the bad guy a lot of the time. Like, he is, he means well, but he isn't really thinking through what what it is that he actually wants when it comes right down to it. He wants to protect his friend and he's saying that in a vague sense, but if you really follow that through to its conclusion, he wants to protect his friend by getting his friend to do what he says and doesn't want anything to change. And you know, the fact that he's like, I can't believe he didn't tell me about you and him. You can't because I wouldn't have either. I've got to be honest. I don't think I would. First of all, it really wasn't his, his secret to tell to begin with, because this is something that's extremely personal to Nick and you need to be a little bit more respectful of that. But then when he tells everybody else and you're still like at this little get together with Nick, giving him the cold shoulder. Yeah, I can see him telling everybody, but you come on. So it's just, it, it's annoying because this, the apology that we get from him eventually, it just did not feel quite adequate to me. It just didn't. It felt like, you know, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done whatever. And then everything is like fine and we move on. And maybe that's just how that shit can be sometimes. But it, for me as a viewer... I really didn't feel like it was resolved. I didn't feel like Tao actually understood yet what it was really that he had done that was so unreasonable. Um, so 
anyway, so yeah, this conversation ends with Tao telling Nick, you should talk to him and Nick saying you should too. And him being like, no, I'm just going to keep being pissed at him. We then have, uh, Nick messaging Charlie asking what's wrong and him not replying. And then we cut to the next day, which is the sports day and an awful moment where Nick comes in and Charlie's standing there in the gym and shies away and then just turns and walks away. And Nick is left standing there looking like he got like punched right in the heart. Um, and it turns out that Tao has not signed up for any event. So he does eventually get hunted down and Charlie offers to do the race for him because he truly hates running and he you know, takes one for the team here in an effort to like patch things over because all Charlie does is try to be accommodating for, to everybody. Um, there's also a lot of like tension because of L who, you know, had used to go to this school and obviously had put up with a lot of bullying and is now at the girls school. And then she has to come back here and the very mixed emotions that can come from that. It's such a weird thing where, to me, like the concept of having separate boys and girls schools, but then they're right next to each other. So there's still a lot of intermingling. And, you know, there's a part of me that feels like it would have been nice to not think about boys during school and be a little bit more focused for that. You know, me being hetero, because granted, it's not going to be that way for everybody. But uh, then I just, God, I really loved boys, guys. And that would have been, I feel like I would have missed out on a lot. Um, so anyway, the uh, we have the scene then where Charlie is trying to hide in the art room. And his teacher says, I am not going to make you go to sports today because I'm a nice teacher. And I thought that hiding from it all was safer and easier when I was your age too. But sometimes the loneliness is just as bad. Don't let anybody make you disappear, Charlie. And he leaves him there. And I kind of thought maybe Charlie would sit anyway and just be like, you know, obstinate. But instead, he goes back out. He decides that he's not going to hide. And good for you, kiddo. Like, honestly, this is the sort of thing that I can be really bad with where somebody tells me, well, you know, don't let people make you hide yourself. And then I, because somebody like gave me advice or an instruction, I just do the opposite because I'm just such a fucking baby. Like, you guys do not know how contrarian I can be sometimes. I mean, you probably do. What am I saying? You listen to the show. I'm, I'm sure you do. But it is wild to me how much I want to do the opposite of what I'm told instantly. Like, it, it, even when I decide I'm going to do something, you know, if I write down a to-do list, I will be like, just because I wrote it down doesn't mean I have to do it. Like, it's just a list. It's not the boss of me. It's kind of like the vibe I get. Um, So... Anyway, yeah, Charlie agrees that he's going to take this on instead. And he goes into, you know, the starting on your marks moment. And uh, the sprint, he is behind Ben. And I really, you guys, I this bad sportsmanship, lots of witnesses. I know that he can't. I wanted him to tackle Ben and smash his face into the dirt so badly desperately he winds up winning the dash loved this for him his friends are all hugging on the side and he goes up to ben here and he says you don't get to have an opinion about anything i do and ben says you want me to go around telling people about you and nick in the most short-sighted ploy I have ever seen in my life. So glad that Charlie immediately responds, do you want me to go around telling people about me and you? That's what I thought, except I wouldn't do that because I'm a decent person. Ooh. 
Thank you, Charlie. Yes. This. Oh my God. I like, do you want me to go? The, the fucking violence of threatening to out somebody just cause you're pissed. What an absolute monstrous thing to do. And he says, you don't get to make me feel like crap anymore just because you hate yourself. So leave me alone. Just leave me alone. And walks away and leaves Ben in the dirt. So grateful. So glad. Uh, Cindy says, did you notice Ben's tears in this scene? Uh, I was just looking at his face and I didn't see any tears. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to rewind it a little bit. Uh, no, I don't see any tears. He looks angry and like his eyes get red, but he's not crying. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so yeah, this is the moment where both Charlie and Tao start to say, I'm sorry. At the same time, Charlie says, I should have been a better friend. Tao says, I shouldn't have gotten angry at you. And then they just hug. And Tao says, I made it so hard for you to tell me. And Charlie says, I should have been looking out for you as much as you were looking out for me. And I genuinely don't even know what he means by that. Like, you know, this is the sort of thing where it's everybody is apologizing to each other. No, I'm so sorry, but only Tao needs to apologize. Like, that's where I sit with this. You know, it, it feels like we're supposed to do the like, well, you know, both of them could have been better about things. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't feel like, I don't feel like Charlie has something to apologize for. I just don't. Uh, Dion says Tao was also getting bullied by Harry though. Yeah. And so was Charlie. Tao was the one deciding to like get in and mix it up. That was not Charlie's responsibility. He knows that Charlie isn't up for it. So like that's not on Charlie. If he doesn't want to start shit with Harry, he doesn't have to. Charlie is willing to just put his head down and just get on with his day. And Tao is the one who doesn't want that for Charlie and decides like, okay, well, I'll step in. When Charlie actually asks him not to do that because he doesn't want it to turn into a thing. So it's really like Tao once again wanting Charlie to react a certain way when that's just Charlie has made it clear not how he wants things to be handled. So I don't know. I just look, there's there's a lot of things that I have covered I will say this, where a big conflict ends with both sides apologizing to each other. And I do not feel that one of them needs to be apologizing. This happens so, so often. And I don't know if that's just me and me being sort of an unreasonable person or if, because I, when I feel this way, it tends to be that other people seem to agree with me based on comments that I get. So I think that writers feel this need to make it be like, well, you know, there was wrong on both sides just for like the sake of it sometimes when it really wasn't actually, you know what I mean? I don't know. Uh, Dion says, Tao watched Charlie get really badly bullied by guys like Harry last year that resulted in how he feels so worthless. He felt like he had to stop the bullying at some point. I mean... Like, the thing is, we didn't see that. And Harry being, like, Charlie being bullied, I don't doubt that that contributes to things, but it also feels like this is part of his personality, which can certainly be a thing. I'm not saying that Tao, like, standing up for his friend was the wrong thing to do, but I don't feel like Charlie needs to apologize to Tao for... Like the point of standing up for somebody is that 
you do that because you know they can't, which is basically what Tao has said. And you don't do for some, some things for somebody knowing they can't do it for themselves if you then expect them to like have your back the same way. Because the whole point is that they couldn't see it the same way or couldn't do it the same way. Like that's beyond their capability. So I like, did he expect Charlie to like come in and like start shooting one liners at Harry or punching him? Like that's not him. He knows that's not him. Uh, Stacy says, got a bolt looking forward to listening to the rest of the app, especially when Nick tells his mom, one of those hand ringing scenes. Oh yeah. That's a good one. Um, Dion, we see it in enemy episode one through Nick's animated flash. Sure. But a flashback, you know what I'm saying? That's not the same thing. It's just, that wasn't part of this show. And even if it were, I stand by this. Like you can't stand up for your friend and then get mad that they didn't stand up for you. When the point of you standing up for them was that they can't do this. They aren't good at it. So I just, I really don't understand what, he thought Charlie was going to do. It's just a weird, you know, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't ultimately matter. They're friends again. I'm going to need some time to get past this. That's all I can say about Tao. And he immediately does. I have a long list of movies I need to force you to watch. And Charlie says he's going to hate most of them. Me and Al are going to go look at where uh, a lot of her old classrooms, she want to come. And he says, no, I'll be fine. You go have fun. So things seem to be better between the two of them. Hooray. We have a montage here of Isaac, who does the javelin. Uh, I have never thrown a javelin. It looks very hard. Then we go to L and, uh, and, Tao running like down the hallways and looking through different like classrooms. It's such a funny thing because they're just like glancing into rooms and I don't know what's determining which one they're going to go into. But um, eventually they do just like go in and sit down and they have a little bit of a moment. Meanwhile, uh, Tara does the high jump and she like has this moment of victory and Darcy greets her and they have a kiss and Darcy seems a little startled that Tara kissed her. I wonder if Tara had been pulling away a little bit and finally kissing her in public again is like reaffirming. Yes. I don't feel like I did the wrong thing. You know, I am with you and everybody can know that and that's fine. Um, so when we cut to, to Tao and L. They're in the art room and they're looking at this painting of trees lining what looks like a slate sidewalk of some kind. It's very impressionistic. And Taz says, didn't it take you like four months? And she says, yep, I was here every lunchtime. And it really is beautiful. Um, four months does seem wild to me, but you know, what do I know? And they start talking about landscapes and Tao says his isn't good. It's on the drying rack and she goes and pulls it out and it's the four of them as friends. And she's like, this doesn't really count as a landscape if it has people in it. Um, but it is cute. It's interesting too. I don't know if there's any significance to this, but the way this is done is Tao is like, it's all of them under a tree in the sun. Tao is laying back on his hands and L is on the ground sitting next to him. And then Isaac is furthest off reading a book and Charlie is standing as well. So it's like only L and Tao are sitting and there's a significance to me to that. Like the two of them being the ones that are the most together out of the group. And they have a couple little moments where it looks like maybe she's going to tell him how she feels about him, but she doesn't. And him looking at her with a kind of like, oh, these two. And they have, there's little paper birds on the table that are like the animation, but they're actually there on the table where they're laying. And it, I was like, oh, I see what you're doing. That's cute. I really wanted her to tell him, but... Also, we need something to carry us through the next season as well. So I get that. 
you know, you can't, you got to leave them wanting more. So that's kind of the end of things between the two of them. They, you know, have their moment where they run off and then there's the rugby game. And, uh, Nick is looking for Charlie, doesn't see him, is getting distracted, upset. Eventually he scores a touchdown. I don't know what these are called. And he's supposed to like start the next round. I don't even know. He's meant to throw the ball. And he finally turns and spots Charlie. And because Charlie's, I think, standing on like a picnic table or bleachers or something off to the side. And Nick literally in the middle of the game tosses the ball to the coach and just walks off the field to Charlie and takes his hand and pulls him aside. I thought he was going to kiss Charlie in front of everybody. And I mean, honestly, taking his hand is almost as good. Like that's still sending a pretty clear signal, even if it's not, it was a very clearly not a platonic hand holding moment, you know? And when he goes running off, you see Imogen looking after him and her expression of like, Oh, like she's happy for him is sweet. Uh, and one of the other students saying, sir, aren't you going to tell Nick that he has to play the match? And he says, nah, I'm good. <laughs> um, so the conversation between the two of them is so great. This is what I'm talking about with Charlie being like, he says, I really like you. And Charlie says, you don't have to say that. I'm going to say it. And I'll keep saying it until you believe me. I don't care about getting into fights or pissing off my mates or anything like that. It's all worth it to be with you. You are the kindest, most thoughtful and caring person and amazing person in the whole world. And if you really want to break up, then I would respect your decision. But I want us to be together. You're my favorite person. I need you to believe me. And Charlie says, Nick, I believe you. And they kiss and it's adorable. It's sweet. It's so everything. I love this so much. You guys, these two, the chemistry, amazing off the charts. It's so good. And, uh, I just really love the, the, I'm going to say it until you believe me, like that's kind of the way you got to go with certain people. Um, so the two of them having their little moment, they are like right in the middle of the hallway. And as they're kissing, Charlie's like, we're, we're in the corridor. And Nick says, Oh, so what? In a moment of real throwing caution to the wind are you free on sunday and he takes nick along on a trip without or not nick nick takes charlie on a trip without telling him where they're going now this is the sort of thing that you have to completely suspend your disbelief because one if he bought the tickets he would have to like keep them completely secret there couldn't be any signage indicating where they're going. Once they get on the train, there's always like an announcer that says like in, you know, in three miles, Durham. And the whole way he doesn't know where he's going. I doubt it. It's fine. It does not matter. Eventually he hears seagulls and Nick pulls his hand off of Charlie's eyes and they are at the beach. And this is so funny to me because the beach is an extremely different scene in Britain than it is here. Like, it's just so, you know, the whole vibe of it is much more Coney Island. And they there's no sand when they're on the beach. They're just laying on, on lots of stones and whatnot. And... It's a, it's a very sweet, like cute seaside outing that feels very specific. All of the vibes here are really, it feels almost like a carnival, you know, 
Um, so we get a montage of them, you know, getting their pictures taken various places and getting something to eat. And they're in the photo booth kissing and they are so cute. You guys, I can't with, I, I seriously can't. And, uh, I just, I, ugh. like, can they actually be together in real life, please? This is when you start shipping like actors and then it gets into really weird territory. That's not usually that awesome. So then Nick says, what if I came out? And Charlie is like, do you really want to? And he says, I, I really want to. I know I've been pretty unsure of everything for a while, but like, I'm definitely bisexual and I don't want to have to sneak around pretending we're platonic BFFs. And you can see how absolutely elated Charlie is. He says, I don't want to make a big announcement, but I want to tell the people who matter. And I want you to be able to tell people too. Oh my God, I like you so much. And I love liking you. He doesn't say I love you, but he says I love liking you. And then we get this hilarious moment, you guys, where... Charlie says, does this mean we're boyfriends? <laughs> and Nick just looks at him and says, yeah, are you kidding? <laughs> and it's like, did us making out like constantly over the past few weeks not already make that clear i really i thought i thought we were on the same like he seems genuinely confused by this <laughs> oh and nick just says oh <laughs> we never we never like confirmed it and nick's just looking at him like nonplussed it's very adorable and he picks Charlie up and carries him. He's like knee deep in the water. I love him carrying him. I really thought he was tossing Charlie into the water. I really did. And that water looks cold as hell. Oh my God, it looks so cold, you guys. <laughs> so uh, the two of them snuggle up and he goes home. He's glowing. And his mother... Is like, oh my God, you're very smiley. You must have had a good time. And Nick says, yeah, it was really good. And you can see his mood starting to like, not dwindle, but he, he just sort of begins to simmer down a little bit. And he sits with his mom and is like, you know that Charlie is my best friend. And she interrupts and is like, well, if you're going to ask him if he can come with us on our holiday, the answer is no, because I've already booked the tickets. No, that's not what I was going to say. And she seems she's like scanning her iPad while they're talking. But once he says this, she see, like realizes, oh, I need to give him my attention. And he says, he's my boyfriend. He just says it. Charlie's my boyfriend. And you can see her like expression just soften and he says i still like girls but uh we I, I i like boys too and me and charlie were we're together and you know and i just wanted you to know and she is like all teary eyed and she says, oh, baby. And she gives him this big hug and says, thank you for telling me. I'm sorry if I ever made you feel like you couldn't tell me that. And he's clearly like so relieved. And she says, and you don't have to say you like girls if you don't. And he says, no, it's definitely not just guys. I, uh, I, it's called bisexuality. If you've ever heard of that. <laughs> Oh, uh, I love that because her just being like, babe, yeah, I have heard of it. But like, it's honestly a pretty val valid question because like so many people do not think that being bi is a thing. So 
he does I don't think he means it that way, but a part of me was like, it's you know what, you should definitely ask just in case. Um let's see. Oh, Cindy says the redhead on the train is Alice Oseman, the author of the series. <gasps> That's precious. Oh, I love that. Um and Nick doesn't know that when Charlie called himself Ben's boyfriend, Ben was like, oh, no, even though they were making out every day. That did occur to me. Yeah. Just like, you know, this is the second time he's asked that. And the first time it went so badly. Like, ew, what? No. And then this dude is like, uh, is this a real question? I've been saying we're boyfriends, like, in my head for six months. What do you even mean? <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is just uh, a lovely moment, the two of them, because like, I wanted her to be very supportive, but you never know. You just don't, you know? And, uh, she says, how long have you known? And he said, we started going out a couple months ago, but I began to like him like way before that. And she's just really so sweet. She just says, Oh, I love you. And she starts hugging him again. And it's like a little flashback to the two of them and how they first met and the way things went. And it's just a wonderful montage of the two of them before we go to credits. And it was a lovely finale. It was very, very sweet. <sighs> it's nice. Like, you know, there was a, there was certainly no downplaying of the realities of the difficulty in coming out and the, you know, variety of responses you're going to get. But I feel like the show did as good a job as they could of being like portraying everything in a, as a positive light as possible while being real about it. And I just, I thought it was really, really well done. Um, see Dion says like Olivia Coleman call back to her queer role in the 18th century Queen Anne that won her the Oscar in the favor I still haven't seen that um oh you seem to really enjoy this show thanks Cindy and Natasha oh thank you Dion for coming and thank you to um Agnes I'm trying to remember it was Agnes right who commissioned the other episode Elin right Elin is uh the name they go by in the discord um, but yeah, thank th thanks to them as well for helping Cindy commission this. And I'm so glad that I got to watch it because this is definitely the kind of thing that somebody could tell me was really cute, but I probably wouldn't bother with because it's, you know, clearly a romance and I just usually am not that into romance. It's just not my thing a lot of the time. And I'm really glad that doing spoil me's means that I am forced to like watch and read things that I would otherwise just be like, I don't, I have other stuff that I would rather spend my time on in this immediate moment. So it's not like I would never, but it's definitely not going to be prioritized. So I wind up just like with a lot, a big variety of things that I wind up watching and reading and it's worked out super well. So it's always, uh, a bit of a gamble because you don't know if I'm going to like something right away. But, um, Cindy says, as soon as Rashawn said she loved it, I knew I had to commission it. Yeah, that's right. Cause I mentioned it to Rashawn and she was like, isn't it so cute? Um, there's another one that somebody had tried to commission an episode of, uh, yellow jackets and they try to like skate around the way that things are done. So I wound up having to cancel their booking and refund them because it wasn't done correctly. But, um, that is another one that's been mentioned to me by a few people and I haven't gotten a chance to try out yet. But, uh, anyway, all right. I have to wrap this up but again. Um, to everybody who is listening, I hope that you enjoyed, you know, my coverage, the discussions, everything. If you're interested in seeing the second season get covered, spoil me dot simply book dot me. And that will take you to my booking page and you just book a classic TV episode. And, uh, there's add-ons. If anybody wants to like watch me watch an episode, there's like the voyeur add-on, but, um, you know, there are certain shows that that's like particularly good for. I don't know that this one, it would be necessary, but I, I had that, uh, <laughs> I had that for certain episodes of some shows and it was really fun. So anyway, thank you guys again. Hope you enjoyed. Until next time.
Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.